Welcome to the Lock Sportscast, your weekly source for Lock Sport news. This is episode 120, recorded September 25th, 2022. I'm your host, Charles Curran. And in today's episode, more Brinks heist questions, new burglary trick, Vatican keys, slot machine hacking, inside the Alpha Lock, new products, events, meetups, criminals, sales, giveaways, and more. You can subscribe to the audio version of the show on most podcast apps and at thelocksportscast.com. You can subscribe to the video version on YouTube, Odyssey, or Apple Podcasts. Links to stories discussed will be in the show notes. Full show notes can always be found at thelocksportscast.com. This week, we'll start right off with the Brinks heist. There was another article published in the LA Times called Brinks Heist Mystery, Questions About a Timeline That Doesn't Make Any Sense. They say that questions are swirling around the timeline laid out by Brink's legal filings and Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department documents. The Brink's big rig, which was loaded with the wares of the jewelers participating in the International Gem and Jewelry Show, departed San Mateo County Event Center on July 11th for a storage yard about 370 miles south in downtown Los Angeles. According to legal filings in the lawsuit Brinks filed against the jewelers, said that its two drivers made the roughly 298-mile drive from San Mateo to the Flying J Travel Center in Lebec in about two hours and four minutes, including a stop at a rest area. To traverse that distance so quickly, the vehicle would have had to been driving at speeds of over 140 miles an hour. That same drive, if driving the Speed limit would take about four hours. The article also raises questions about the timing of the authorities' response to the crime, a crime in which 22 bags of loot were stolen while one of the drivers supposedly slept inside the vehicle berth and the other was getting food at the Flying J truck stop. A sheriff's department incident said that both drivers told a deputy that their vehicle left San Mateo at 12.01 a.m., information also noted by Brink's legal filing. At 2.05 a.m., according to Brinks, the big rig arrived at Flying J and the driver went in to get his meal. Upon his return 27 minutes later, at 2.32 a.m., the driver discovered that the 18-wheeler had been compromised. A news release by the Sheriff's Department on July 18th reiterated that same time frame. The report, which was drawn from initial interviews with the drivers, said that deputies responded to a vehicle burglary call for service at the truck stop around 3.56 a.m. It did not say when the drivers alerted law enforcement, leaving unclear how much time elapsed between the crime, its reporting, and authorities' response. When asked about the crime, Los Angeles County Sheriff's Sergeant Michael Malinsky said, We are not prepared to provide updated information at this time, though he noted that investigators with the department's major crimes bureau had conducted in-depth interviews with all those involved. It should be said that it is always possible that the improbable timeline laid out by Brinks and the sheriff's department could be attributed to simple misstatement or some other error. However, an attorney for the jewelers said that the sequence of events described by Brinks doesn't make any sense. Why are we not being told what happened here? This can't be. Our clients deserve an explanation. The victims suffered a life-altering theft, and they are given a set of facts that doesn't add up. He also said that the most unlikely element of the timeline relates to the 18-wheeler's journey as it approached the grapevine. Brinks said that the vehicle stopped at the Buttonwillow rest area about 1.49 a.m. so the drivers could use the bathroom. It then continued on to the Flying J, reaching it 16 minutes later. The Buttonwillow rest area is roughly 55 miles from the Flying J. Covering that distance in little more than a quarter of an hour would require driving at speeds of over 200 miles an hour. Brinks first disclosed the timeline in an August 4th lawsuit filing against the jewelry companies. The complaint is part of a wider legal dispute between Brinks and the jewelers over the value of the stolen property. Covered that in the last episode of the podcast. The sheriff's incident report, which was dated July 11th, reveals new details about the heist. Written by a deputy who arrived on the scene, 
The report said that the driver who dined at the Flying J found upon his return to the vehicle that its lock had been cut away and the latches, where the lock once was, were bent and the lock was nowhere to be found, end quote. The sleeping driver noted that he, quote, did not see who committed the burglary or hear anything unusual or notice that they were being followed by anyone, end quote. But the report said that the thieves left something behind, metal fragments at the base of the trailer's locking mechanism. The incident report said that the trailer's cargo, which included gems, jewelry, watches, and other precious items, was contained in orange marked Brinks bags. It also said that the blue 2019 Volvo Big Rig was marked Brinks. Interestingly, the report did not note the presence of vehicle security features that the jewelers and others in the industry have said that they expected Brinks to have when shipping valuable merchandise. For example, the report does not mention an alarm on the door of the trailer or cameras anywhere in the vehicle. Arnold Duke, president of the International Gem and Jewelry Show, said that he was under the impression that everything had satellite tracking, cameras, and alarms. But evidently, there is no indication that those items were present in any of the official reports. And you would think if they had a satellite tracking, the company would know exactly what the time frame was, what the, the pertinent times were in the travel to the Flying J truck stop. But obviously something is wrong somewhere, either the time they departed or the time they arrived. The article also says that investigators believe that the heist was carried out by sophisticated criminals given the lack of violence and the speed of the thieves' work, among other factors. Sheriff's Department investigators who are working with the FBI have said that they have obtained video footage related to the incident. So maybe they did have video cameras on the trailer or possibly... It's video from the truck stop. A lot of truck stops have video surveillance. So maybe that was the video they're talking about. We won't know for sure for a while. A lot of interesting stuff going on with this Brinks heist. A lot of unanswered questions. And it's strange that they would file something, a timeline that was so obviously wrong, in legal filings in court. And part of a lawyer's job is to look over things and make sure that what they're filing is true and accurate. Rather interesting. This is going to be a fun one to follow, I think. I'll keep you posted as more stuff comes to light. And over in the UK, a locksmith is issuing a warning about a, quote, new burglary trick that takes seconds to get into your home. The article says that a locksmith, Linton Christian, has issued a warning after seeing a trick used multiple times to gain access to properties. He said it involves putting a magnet or some other flat object which can be stuck across the bolt hole of a door of a home they wish to enter. Uh, They'll do it during daylight hours when the occupants are home. He says it only takes seconds. All it requires is that the door is left unlocked or ajar by the homeowners for a moment. He said that burglars will return to the home later when the occupants are sleeping or out of their house so that they can freely enter due to the lack of working lock. He says this new trick relies on the homeowner not discovering the reason why their door isn't locking or hoping for the best and putting off acting until the next morning, by which time the criminals may have already struck. And he says he has seen the trick used across the area he works in. So, interesting. I'm not exactly sure how the UK locks work, but this is actually kind of an old trick here in the States. This is a trick we used in high school to get into classrooms. One of a few tricks we used. Anyway. Like I said, I'm not really familiar with how the latch system on the doors he's talking about works, but uh, might be something to be aware of. I don't know if it is really a new trick over there or not, but I don't really think it's a new trick here. Uh, In fact, tape across the latch was one of the things that got the Watergate burglars caught. Definitely not a, uh, a new trick, at least in the United States. I ran across this that I thought was interesting, so I mentioned it. The Grand Canyon University's Cyber Center of Excellence kicked off the year with an open house on Tuesday in their technology building. The event included several hands-on stations, including lockpicking. Visitors could also participate in a Capture the Flag event. Anyway, just thought it was interesting that their open house included a lockpicking station. And Sylvester Stallone has made the Locksport news. By posting a picture on Instagram of 
holding two very large key rings. The description on the video said, very rare and special moment. I was allowed to hold the keys that open every single door to, in the entire Vatican City, including the Sistine Chapel. So glad we named our beautiful daughter this beautiful name, Sistine. Of course, they wouldn't let me out of their sight with the keys. I don't blame them. Now, a lot of people in the comments made a lot of jokes, but also um, pointed out that there's a lot more security in Vatican City than just the keys. They have a lot of security guards. But I still would consider this a failure of the security team by letting him take a po picture and post it publicly of the keys, unless they're not actually the real keys. Uh, but this appears to be a total failure of the security team. There's no way, if I were running the security team, that I would let even a celebrity post a picture of my keys. Uh, this next story has actually been out for a while, uh, since early August, I think. And I've seen it many, many times, but I hadn't covered it yet. Locksmith and deputies start evicting woman from home she owns. This was in Pasco County, Florida. A woman uh, was surprised when she received a ring doorbell alert showing two deputies and a locksmith at her front door. They were drilling through her lock and they said they were there to finalize the eviction, which she was shocked to hear because she owns her home. Once she started questioning the officers and saying she didn't know about any eviction, she was paid up on her bills. Uh, they asked her to identify herself, which she did. And while that was happening, one of the officers walks back and takes a look at the number on the house and calls the other officer back when they suddenly realize that they have just attempted to make entry into the wrong home. Uh, they told her that they meant to go to the house next door and that they were sorry and the locksmith would install a new lock to replace the one that they had broken. The Pasco County Sheriff's Office says the incident was a mistake and is now under investigation. The lady says she was happy she was able to stop the mistaken eviction and whatever else would have entailed, like possibly finding all of her belongings on the curb. So this is always an important thing to remember. Uh, anytime you're going, if you are in law enforcement or you are a locksmith, double check, triple check, make sure you are at the right house. If you are serving a warrant, if you are doing an eviction, uh, if you're doing a reheat, double, triple check your address. You don't want to be this person and things could end up a lot worse. Then over on Twitter, Locksmith Ledger announced their 2023 van contest, where they said, driving the baddest rig on the road, we want to see it. Enter Locksmith Ledger's 2023 van contest to confirm your status. We're judging interior, exterior, innovation, and overall details. And as was pointed out in the comments by uh, iFisk, I believe, that this is not really probably a good idea, especially nowadays with the number of locksmiths we've seen being robbed uh, at gunpoint for the contents of their van. Admittedly, it's probably not likely that those people that are doing the robberies are going to be watching Locksmith Ledger's Twitter feed or po blog posts to see which locksmiths to hit, but it's probably still not a good idea to be advertising the contents of your van in today's climate. Over on Hackaday and a couple other sites, um, there were articles posted all by the same, all the same article, just posted on multiple different sites and with slightly different titles. Uh, Robot opens master combination locks in less than a minute. This was, these were written by Robin Keery. The article highlights a machine that can open a master combination lock very, very quickly. The operating principle is based on previous research done by Sammy Kimkar uh, from a couple of years ago. The principle being that the combination can be found by applying a small amount of pressure on the shackle and searching for locations on the dial where the movement becomes heavier or more difficult. The logarithm can then be used to completely determine the first and third numbers and find a list of just eight candidates for the second number, making it really quick to just try those sequentially and open the lock. The article includes a link to a YouTube video, which is silent, but demonstrates the principle on, uh, I believe it's three locks in a row. 
The article also links a previous Hack Day article from 2013 about a University of Wisconsin Madison team that built an automatic master lock cracker as well. Interesting one to check out there. Uh, links to the Hackaday article in the show notes if you want to check it out further. All the machines that have been built to take advantage of this purpose are for finding the combination of lost locks. Just to be clear, the locks have to be mounted in this device in such a way that they cannot be done on locks in use in the field. Just, just to be clear, <laughs> these are really only useful for finding the combination to a lock that you find in a drawer or something like that. Um, really, just novelty because you can type of uh, devices. Moving on to videos, we have a new video series being started by the Lockpicker 1969. It is called This Old Lock Series. And says that in this video series, he'll be sharing his antique and vintage lock collection, typically organized by specific lock makers. And we'll try to provide some history about the lock maker, show some of the locks made by them, and pick a lock or two out of the collection. So if that if you're into vintage lock and the history of locks and lock makers, that might be a good series for you to check out. He has a playlist started with the first two episodes in it. And Alexander Mundy put out a video called Solar Letters Safe Lock Preview, in which he shows off his Solar Letters Safe Lock and shows how it basically works and what pieces are currently missing from the one he was able to procure. And if you're really into these odd uh, foreign safe locks. This is a really good channel to check out. Alexander Mundy, link to this video uh, in his show notes. Check it out and uh, consider subscribing. I love seeing all these obscure safe locks from around the world. I'm sure it costs him quite a bit of money to procure these things. And Lock Picking Cuber put out a video called Taking a Look Inside the Alpha Lock, in which he goes through and attempts to disassemble his alpha lock. He takes a look at how it's made and the mechanism and how it basically works. So if you, like me, are not quite willing to risk damaging your alpha by taking it apart, be a good video to check out. The last video is by a channel called Vince Vintage. And it's entitled How This Device Illegally Won $44.9 Million from Las Vegas. And it's a, basically a history of slot machine hacking and slot machine uh, cheating devices. Pretty cool stuff. So if you've had questions about how this was done in the past and the fairly recent past, check it out. Uh, link will be in the show notes. I found it quite interesting after my questions a while back about uh, a story I covered that had some sort of slot machine hacking device in it. So I found it quite interesting to find this video that had some of the history of that in it. So check it out. Link in the show notes. Moving on to products. Lockpickworld.com has Yale profile leashy style picks in stock. They are leashy style picks. They are not officially leashy picks. But if you have a need or a desire to have Yale profile leashy, they have two different versions. They have one for US style rim cylinders and one for Euro cylinders, basically just mirror images. The uh, keyway is flipped upside down for the, the Euro version versus the rim cylinder version. Uh, those are currently, it looks like, selling for $89.87 US. Southord announced that it has replacement tension tools for its pen lock pick sets. You can find those on their site. And they are currently $2.85 a piece. Link will be in the show notes. Moving on to events and meetups. Roughly chronological order here. We have B-Sides Augusta in Georgia on October 1st. And here's a new one. The Dallas Hackers Association, October 5th. And they will have a lock sport room, they say. Yankee Security v Convention. October 19th through the 23rd, and they will have topics including locksmithing, electronics, access controls, safes, automotive locksmithing, and more. And that takes place in Springfield, Massachusetts, I believe. Let's see here. We have a DEFCON D 
DC 207 event taking place October 20th at the John Mitchell Center in Gorham, Maine. And it says, learn lockpicking, safecracking, and more while you socialize with Maine's best hacker community. Lockpicks will be available to borrow or take home with a donation. Now let's see. Secure WV, October 21st through the 22nd, Charleston Coliseum and Convention Center, Charleston, West Virginia. And they will reportedly have some lock sport content there. Locktoberfest taking place in Chicago at the Pumping Station 1 Hackerspace on October 22nd. B-Sides Triad 2, October 22nd as well in Greensboro, North Carolina. Saint Con 2022 in Provo, Utah, October 25th through the 28th with uh, obviously some lock sport content there with Deviant having a keynote. B-Sides Charleston taking place in Charleston, South Carolina, November 19th. Pacific Hackers Conference 2022, taking place in Mountain View, California, November 18th and 19th. And Canberra Locksport meets every second Sunday of the month in Fishwick, Australia. Links to all of those will be in the show notes. Moving on to Lockpickers United belts, we have several new belts to announced this week we have a couple of purples we have san waro and dependent quartet 577 both earning purple this week congratulations to both of you and we have four new brown belts we have snazzy and lily sharkmancer wen and b1 blatt and bandito brandito 07 all earning brown this week congratulations to all of you And for anyone who's not already familiar with the Lockpickers United belt system, links in the show notes to lots of information and videos about the system. So be sure to check that out. Now it's time to take a quick break. Say thank you to the people that made this particular episode possible. I'll start with the financial supporters. Uh, These include Patreon and Subscribestar members. We have uh, Jimmy Longs, Medler, Pandafrog, Michael Gilchrist, Starion Lock, Williams Brain, Dave Dewey Deciphered, Lee Bond's Locksport Journey, Pat from Uncensored Tactical, Three Raccoons in a Coat, Anthony, a.k.a. Terrell, Dr. Hogmaster, Clayton Howard, a.k.a. Cooltoon, uh, Mog, John Lock, Rat Yoke, Mr. Picker, Frankie Lockpicker, JHB Picking, Barebones Lockpicking, Deadbolt Cafe, NWA Lockpicker, and Snake. Thank you to all of you. Content producers for this episode. We start with the chief content producer, with the which is uh, Cheryl, aka Anthony. Uh, other content producers: Barebones Lockpicking, Ifisk, Jimmy Longs, Joshua Gonzalez, Knox Locks, Lock Fumbler, Lock Heat Lockpicking, The Lockpicker 1969, and Tony Varelli. Thank you to all of you for your support. Just remember, the show is only possible because of all that support. So, if you value this podcast, please help support it by sending in your news, links, events, giveaway information, anything you have that's Locksport related, anything you think the community should know or would like to know, send it to podcast at thelocksportscast.com or any of the other methods listed in the show notes. Don't forget to share the show with your lockpicking friends, leave a comment, review, thumbs up, whatever your platform allows, subscribe on your favorite platform. And if you want to support financially, you can either be a PayPal, Patreon, or Subscribestar. If you donate or share information that I use in the show, I will give you credit in the show and in the show notes, just like the people I previously mentioned. And again, thank you for all of your continued support. Moving on to lockpicking criminals. We will start off with a story that I ran across titled Gang Arrested on Suspicion of High-End Robberies Across Spain. The article says that police have detained a gang who are believed to have been involved in a number of high-profile robberies across Spain and Europe. Three members of the gang, who are all understood to be Georgian, are suspected of robbery with force and were caught red-handed after a break-in where they had stolen jewels, money, and a safe. Officers believe the gang are responsible for multiple robberies in Spain and had connections with gangs across Europe where their stolen goods could be sold on the black market. Officers began investigating them at the start of the year after they were identified as being the main suspects in a series of robberies. After the arrest, large quantities of jewelry, money, and safes, as well as lockpicking tools, were confiscated. And interestingly, the picture of their equipment in the article 
is fascinating. If you look at the picture, they have a very nice selection of impressioning tools, including like a full set of dimple lock impressioning uh, blanks and foil inserts. So looks like that might have been one of their favorite techniques. And then we have this uh, story, which is not lock picking, but still rather interesting, I thought. Moochie's restaurant robbed. Owner says thief used professional tools to break in. And this is out of Salt Lake uh, in the U.S. The article says that Moochie's meatballs and more in South Salt Lake hopes that their surveillance video will help catch a thief. Surveillance video from the restaurant captured a hooded person using a tool to shatter the glass door at approximately 3.30 a.m. The owner said she definitely knew what she was doing. She was prepared to do this job. She walked up and used a professional tool that she stuck right on the glass and it just shattered the glass. After waiting a couple minutes, security footage captures the thief walking into the restaurant and straight to the back of the shop into an office where the safe was located. The owner said she went to town on that safe. She used a saw for about 30 minutes to get to the cash. Thief made off with about $2,500 US. Now, I don't know what the, quote, professional tool was. You know, there are a lot of glass punches and stuff like that for uh, emergency use and getting through automotive door glass. Could have been something like that. I wouldn't call that a, quote, professional tool. And the way she got into the safe, if you look at the picture, is not professional. Looks like she just went to town hacking and sawing at the safe until she finally got it open. She didn't know particularly where to cut to be most effective it doesn't look like just did as much damage as possible until got an opening big enough to to get it open and get the money out and something that i think is important highlighted by this article is it's not a good idea to store large amounts of cash in your business overnight especially if you don't have an alarm system a secure front door and a uh, proper safe this was obviously, it looks like a cheap century fire safe, not the type of safe you want to store large amounts of cash in. Um, good for possibly storing some important records that you don't want to be damaged in a fire, but not your cash. Just my two cents. Moving on to sales. South Ord has announced that they updated their sales item page again. So if you are interested you can go check that out and see what the new sale items are and we still have a, the review guru link for 10 percent discount at la lock tools bare bones lock picking september coupon still active the code is prince 10 for 10 percent store wide except la lock tools products 3 dlocksportcom 10 percent off if you use the code lscast10 at checkout MakeoLocks.com, 15% off with the code by Mako. And UKLockPickers.co.uk, 10% off with the code GIFT. Moving on to giveaways. We've got a couple of new ones. Lockheed Lockpicking has reached 100 subs and doing a 100 subscriber giveaway. It says, giveaway in appreciation of 100 plus subscribers. This community is great. What do you have to do? Be a subscriber to my channel. Like this video. Comment with the hashtag Lockheed100. And tell me a lock, lock sport related joke or anecdote. And that gives you one entry. And or make a video with hashtag Lockheed 100 and tell me a lock sport related joke or anecdote. And that gives you one entry. So a comment and a video will give you two entries. Drawing will take place somewhere around October 8th. Lock Fumbler is also doing a new giveaway. This one is for 100 videos and 200 subscribers. It is the Hashtag lock 100 fumble 200 and says, I want to celebrate my 100th video and 200 subscribers with a giveaway. And that giveaway ends on October 10th. So follow the link in the show notes and watch that video to figure out how to enter. And the lock picker 1969 is doing weekly giveaways and uh, been having some pretty good turnout in those, it looks like. So be sure to check out those giveaways. Uh, link to his channel in the show notes. And while you're over there, you can check out the this old lock series he's got going on. Knox Locks doing bi-weekly giveaways over on his channel. So be sure to check that out. Link, of course, in the show notes. 
And of course, there's CLK Supplies doing their hashtag LockBoss giveaways weekly. So you can be sure to check those out. And that brings us to the end of an episode. Thank you very much for listening to the whole thing if you've made it to this point. And on a personal note, things that I've been doing actually involved in LockSport as I've had some free time is I've been working on my safe lock electronics projects again. This time, not my auto dialer, but uh, manipulation aids. So a uh, digital dial reader or digital dial magnifier or whatever you want to call it. Basically an encoder driven device to just help you keep track of the small differences and help you graph a safe. I've created a little device that can be either used portably by itself, which is the dial reader uh, with an LCD display. And I've also been working on a computer app that allows you to graph quite easily on the computer with the data directly driven by the dial reader. So if you're interested in all, there are some pictures of what I've been working on in the Discord, the Lock Sportscast Discord. It's kind of a fun project, far from finished, but certainly keeping me busy and uh, giving me something fun and entertaining to do in Lock Sport. I really like the mixture of the electronics and the lock sport, something I've always been interested in is hobby robotics. So anyway, thank you for listening. Thank you for continuing to support the show. Really appreciate all of you very much. So just remember to always keep it legal. <laughs>